we're going to be going through everything you need to know about uh, downloading neon eddy covariance data um, and then working through a little bit of data munging and then plotting that up and, and kind of evaluating the data, looking at, at the data in different ways. So um, first just looking at the time series data, but then also bending and kind of looking at it from a ideal carbon cycle um, standpoint. And so we'll start off by, uh, I'll be live coding today. So um, I'll be typing as we go. And if you, in case you wanna follow along, let me share my screen. Okay, <clears throat> so um, I'll just be uh, typing as we go, but I also wanted to point out that you can grab this tutorial from <clears throat> uh, the web uh, and follow along as well. So if you are interested, you can go here to the Neon Science tutorial page. Um, under Eddy DL cycle, and you can follow along. Um, say if you're not at your, if you don't have all the dependencies ready to, to be able to code. And if you would just rather download the code uh, and follow along, you can do that as well, just by clicking on the link at the, at the bottom of the tutorial page. <clears throat> okay. So, the first thing we we'll want to do uh, is get started by preparing our environment. So we'll we'll download some packages, um, and then we'll set up our um, environment to to be able to do the analysis we're going to do today. And then we're going to set up some arguments to be used for uh, the Neon Utilities package to download some data, uh, some eddy covariance data for us from. Uh, the NEON API and stack that, that data together so we can uh, use that for our analysis. We'll start uh, with that first and then I'll kind of backtrack and give a little bit of overview about the, the products, but because we're downloading a, a fair size of data, uh, I think we should go ahead and get that started now in case it takes a little while for, for it to download. So the first thing we'll do is set up the, the packages that are required um, for this analysis. So I like to set up a variable for that, pack direct. And then we'll just put all the packages that we need into this vectored variable. So we need the bioconductor manager because we're gonna use the RHDF5 our package, which is hosted uh, on Bioconductor. Uh, and then we're gonna add the Neon Utilities package for downloading and stacking the Neon data. And then we're gonna add a couple of additional um, packages, ggplot2, tidyverse, and lubridate for some of the data munging and uh, exploratory plotting that we'll, doing, we'll, we'll be doing. Okay, so now that we have our variables, uh, our packages into a variable. Um, you can just press control and enter to, to run this through the, the console. And then we need to install and load these packages. So the way I like to do that, uh, and I use this pretty much across all of the workflows that I have, is I'll do a L apply across this pack rec variable and then create a, a function to allow it to wrap around 
all the packages that I have in my pack rec variable. So additionally, you can use this requires function to determine if it's already loaded, which is really nice. It can save you a lot of time and prevent you from unnecessarily re-downloading re a package. Um, and the way to do that is you just put require. And now that we have the pack rec uh, as our X variable in our function, we say require, and then we'll just do character only equals true. And if this equals false, it'll mean that the, the package is not installed. And in that case, we will install packages and install the package that it's currently on in the loop. Okay, and then lastly, we'll load that library. So that we'll have it available to us while we're coding. So now if you enter that, it'll check for all the packages and install everything that you need for the analysis. Uh, the next step in preparing our environment, we'll run uh, options strings as factors equals false. And this just will ensure that when we read in uh, data, it won't do any kind of automatic uh, transformation to a factor for us. Um, and this can be important when we're reading in attributes um, associated with the data in the HDF, in the uh, Eddy Covariance HDF5 file. So. Next, we'll get all the, the variables we need ready for the zip by product um, as a, that's part of the neon utility package. So I like to create variables for each of these to, to make it easier to modify my workflows later. So we'll start with a start date. And this comes in the format of just the year and then the month. So for this tutorial, we'll do 2022, April of 2022 to the end date of September. 2022. <clears throat> so we're going to focus on the, the growing season um, so that we can kind of evaluate uh, the main pulse uh, of the, the carbon cycle um, during a year at two of our sites. So, and we're going to evaluate the differences between these two sites. So the sites that we're going to focus on are the Steigerwald, STI, is the neon code, and the Treehaven site. Um, and this is a nice pair of, of sites to, to focus on because they're located relatively close together, with like just over a mile apart from one another. So we know that the differences are, are more related to the vegetation and the management as opposed to say, uh, differences in the climate that the two sites might be experiencing. Uh, so now that we have the site and the start and end date, we'll define our directory for downloading the data. <clears throat> so the, for this tutorial, I'll just use the temp directory that 
uh, R provides. So R Studio provide, provides a, a temp directory associated when, uh, with R. Um, if you just define uh, your file directory as the temp directory, uh, it'll automatically download there. And then after your session is completed, um, all the input data files will, will be cleaned. The cache will be cleaned after you close out of R. So it's a nice benefit of using the temp directory. So then lastly, we will start the download. So we'll use zip by product in the neon utilities package. Um, and you can see that we'll need to define the data product ID, uh, the sites that we want to download data from, the start and end date, uh, and then which package um, that we're looking to download. So for this tutorial, we'll just be downloading the, the basic package for eddy covariance data um, to try to save a little bit of size because the eddy covariance data is already uh, a fairly large data set. Um, if we were to download the expanded files, they, they come in as a uh, daily HDF5 and they have some additional functionality such as uh, footprint matrices and extended uh, quality metrics to allow you to evaluate the data quality. Um, but none of those are, are necessary for, for today's tutorial. Um, additionally, there are other uh, arguments that you can define for the zips by product, such as the release. Um, if you're worried about size, you can you can check the size of the the files before downloading, um, and you can add a token to the Neon API, which uh, really helps with with download speed. So we will start by defining the data product ID. So for the neon eddy covariance files, that data product, uh, and for the higher level flux, flux data products, the data product number is BP4.00200. And I'll show you where to find this information on the NEON uh, data portal as well after we begin this data download. So as mentioned, we will be downloading the basic package. And now we will just map our variables that we created earlier to the arguments to the function. So start date equals start date. And end date equals end date. We will change our save path to the file directory, dear file. And then lastly, we will set check size to false. Um, in case you are worried uh, about the size of the files, um, because it's gonna be around 1.3 gigs, of data that will be downloaded to to your computer uh, for this tutorial so just be warned um, and make sure that you have the resources available for that and so now we will start running this oh sorry we have to run each piece first so We'll set our start date, set our end date, our site, our file directory, and now we'll start the zips by product. So as you can see, it's about 1.23 gigs. Um, so it can take a little while for that to download. So while we're waiting, uh, I have a couple of slides 
to kind of just give an overview. So sorry for just jumping into it, but we wanted to get that started so we can uh, dive a little deeper into the data in, in a little bit. So I'm going to give an overview now of the Neon Surface Atmosphere Exchange data product. Um, and we'll start with a little bit of a background uh, about Neon. So Neon was uh, is supported by the National Science Foundation. Um, the program is was built to to monitor continental scale ecology um, and is operated by Patel. The project is set to operate for for a thirty year time frame, and all the data and samples are are free and and open. Um, and the purpose of the observatory is to, to monitor the drivers and responses to ecological change um, using a standardized framework for research and experiments to, to add on to um, and then ensure that our data is interoperable for integration with other national and international uh, network scale science projects. So that's the kind of uh, operational um, standard that we're looking to live up to. And so that went into the, the NEON observational design. So we have 81 field sites, um, 47 which are terrestrial sites and 34 aquatics. We have, uh, it's separated into 20 ecochromatic uh, domains to be able to monitor um, ecological change across different ecosystems. Um, and as mentioned, it will be operating for, for 30 years uh, and producing over 180 plus data products. So now I'll kind of give a little background about the components of NEON. So we have the terrestrial instrument uh, system, which comprises of a, the NEON tower um, for monitoring uh, micrometeorological data. Uh, and then we have uh, soil sensor arrays um, to monitor, monitor the, the physical properties of the soil. Uh, additionally, we have the terrestrial observation uh, system where, where we have field scientists going out and collecting samples uh, and collecting data in the field. Additionally, we, we have the NEON uh, airborne observation platform which flies uh, the sites on nearly an annual basis. Um, and that collects hyperspectral data, LIDAR data, and RGB. Uh, and additionally, we have aquatic observational and instrumented components as well. So if we zoom in and focus on the terrestrial instrumented system, uh, which we'll be utilizing to, to do the analysis today, um, you can kind of see here that we have uh, the tower uh, and the instrumented hut. Uh, the instrumented hut is kind of where what we call the location controller um, that collects all the data from the different instruments is located. Uh, we have the tower with all the, the atmospheric variable instruments and then the soil array with five replicates extending into the main wind direction or, or the footprint um, of the tower. Additionally, at our core sites, we have uh, a double fence international reference um, that houses a, way, a weighted uh, precipitation gauge um, to kind of give us a, a high standard uh, precipitation value at the site. So how do we measure surface atmosphere exchange? So at NEON Towers, the surface atmosphere exchange system primarily consists of uh, the turbulent components and then the storage components. Um, you need both the turbulent and the storage components to, to get to the net surface atmosphere exchange. And so the, the turbulent system is comprised of the 3D sonic anemometer, uh, and the infrared gas analyzer here that you can see at the tower top. Um, we also have profiles of 
CO2 concentration and H2O concentration going down the towers, um, as well as air temperature uh, that's measured by thermocouples inside of these uh, radiation shields that allow us to calculate the, the storage component. So the profiles are used for the, the storage calculation and uh, the eddy covariance system is, is for the turbulent component. And as you can see, having 47 uh, terrestrial sites, um, there's a lot of different ecosystems that we're monitoring. Uh, and that requires us to have different size towers um, to be able to ensure that we're, we're capturing the data that we need to. For instance, at a, a very tall uh, site like Wind River, we, we have exceptionally tall trees um, with the Douglas firs that uh, are growing at the Wind River site. Um, whereas at the grassland sites or uh, the tundra or, or agricultural sites, um, we don't need to be that far off the ground, uh, just high enough to, to be able to measure in the, in the well mixed layer um, using the eddy covariance system. So <clears throat> the data that we're gonna be evaluating today, um, the flux data is all packaged into the NEON HDF5 file format. And so if you're not familiar with, with HDF5 files, it, it allows you to kind of create a directory structure inside of a single file. Um, and it also allows you to, to be able to uh, put attributes onto this directory structure so that you, you can have all the metadata associated with the data uh, in the same file. Um, another nice aspect to, of the HDF5 files is that we can put an object description um, and a readme inside these files that can kind of help direct our data users uh, on how to find the information that they're looking for within the files themselves. Um, so here you can kind of see the, the directory structure inside of a HDF5 file. Um, and then at the top level here, if we click on uh, the site level, we can see the, the metadata associated with this. So we have the, for instance, the canopy height, the displacement height, um, the measurement level heights, uh, and the lat long ecosystem type. So it's so all the information you would really need to, to be able to uh, work with the data. Um, lastly, the, there are four levels of data products inside these bundled eddy covariance files. Um, level one is just kind of our mean uh, statistics. So you can think of it as the, the mean ratio mold dry CO2. So the, like what is, how many parts per million of CO2 um, are measured at any 30 minute period. Um, and then as we go up to level two, we, we have time interpolated data products. So we use this mostly with our storage data products. So um, all the profile measurements kind of get passed through to this level two data product. Uh, and then level three, we spatially interpolate the storage measurements, uh, the profile measurements, um, so that in level four, we can calculate uh, for instance, the flux, uh, the storage flux of CO2. Um, in this level four product, you can see we, we just have the fluxes uh, where we're combining the measurements from, from level one. So um, we're combining multiple sensors and multiple data products uh, to kind of get these flux measurements. So that's why uh, they're designated as level four products. Um, you can also see here that we, we separate data from quality metrics within this HDF5 framework. Um, and that makes it kind of easier to, to be able to, to do an analysis with the data and, and keep separate the, the quality flags for when we need those for um, either removing data or determining if the data is of the standard that we're looking for. So, 
If we dive down into the Flux products, you can see here that we have the NSA, NSAE um, component, which is the combination of the storage and the turbulent components. Um, and we kind of have them all separated here so you can evaluate uh, each of these separately. Um, and for instance, if the storage component has some data issues for some reason, you can still use the, the turbulent uh, fluxes and vice versa. And so lastly, um, this is kind of what we'll be doing today is working through, uh, you know, downloading these data and um, evaluating them using the Neon Utilities R package. Uh, and here I've added the link to uh, an introductory tutorial um, and then the tutorial that we'll be working through today. So now we should go back to R and see that our data has been downloaded. So now that we have all our data downloaded, um, and we can check that to here. Um, so we can just check that data are there by saying list files in deal file. And then say recursive equals true. And we can see that all of the files that we downloaded for each month uh, are now available to us. So the next step is to stack these data. So we'll create a variable called flux. And We'll use the neon utilities package and the stack eddy function. And you can hear, see here um, for stack eddy, we'll need to provide the file path to, to where these, these files are. Um, and then the level of the data that we want. So in this case, we're, we're just interested in the fluxes. So we'll, we'll do DP4. Um, and if you're working with the level one data, you can define the variable or the averaging period, but that's not necessary in this case. So now we will paste. So we'll give it a file path and we'll paste. Your file. with files to stack. So Neon Utilities automatically creates this uh, subdirectory um, when you download data using zips by product. So you'll need to make sure that your file path includes that. And then we'll just define the level as DP04. And we will run this. So this part of the code can take a second as well as it, uh, it has to unzip the data. Um, if you were to download this data from the portal, uh, you have to unzip the data and then Inside that, you, you have some gzip files, so you, you have to un-gzip them as well uh, before you're able to kind of look at the data. Uh, so I can kind of show you, though, while we're waiting on the, the stack eddy function to work, what a, a downloaded file looks like in
So this is the one of the neon HDF5 files. Um, you can kind of see here at the top level, uh, we have the site ID. And if you click on that, um, it'll show us all the metadata uh, associated with the site level. Um, and then if we dig in and look at the DPO4 uh, and the data product, we can see that um, the units are associated with for, for each data are, are linked at the table level. Um, so for, for instance, here for the turbulent data, um, you can see that we have uh, the micromoles of carbon per meter square per second. Um, and if we open this data, you can see uh, the time and then the fluxes. And this is an expanded file. So we have the, the flux, which is the same as the flux corrected. So we do some additional corrections using our validation system um, to give us the corrected fluxes. And then we have a raw flux that, that is uncorrected. Um, so this is only available in the expanded file. Uh, today we'll be working with the basic file. So we'll only be working with the corrected fluxes. So I just wanted to give you a little, show you a little bit of the HDF5 file format. And now we have all our data stacked into the, this flux variable. And if we look at flux, we can see that we have uh, a list with separate list under that for each site. Um, for the variables, uh, the object description, and the issue log associated with this data product. So if we start with the, the variables, we can kind of see that Neon Utilities gives us a comprehensive list of uh, the variables that we, we have in our flux data, uh, our flux list, um, including the category, so the data, the, the system, so CO2 flux, um, and then the variable itself. So whether it's NSAE, storage, um, along with, uh, the actual variable we're looking at, so that where there's the flux, uh, and then we have the time begin, time end, uh, and the units associated with, with the data. Um, additionally, you can see that we have the QFQM here. So in the basic file, we, we only download the final uh, quality flag, um, which gives us the overall uh, assessment of the data quality. Um, if you want to do a more refined uh, analysis of the quality of the data, uh, you can download the, the expanded files um, and you can you choose which flags you want to uh, apply to the data themselves. Okay, so now we're going to do a little bit of data munging um, to be able to explore the data. So we'll start by creating a variable inside of each data frame or site. And we'll just set that to the site that we're looking at. We'll do the same for Treehaven. Okay, now we'll combine these into a single data frame, which will allow us to do um, some more, I guess, advanced uh, anal uh, analysis and plotting. So we'll do DF flux is equal to, and we'll R bind the two data frames together. 
for each site. And we'll run this. So now you can see that we have a, a combined data frame um, with our, our sites and all of our flux data. So flux CO2, flux H2O, uh, momentum flux, and temperature flux. Additionally, we have some footprint statistics uh, that are also a level four product within the eddy covariance bundle files. So next, we're just going to plot the time series. Um, and during this tutorial, I'll be using uh, a pipe beam mechanism from the dplyr package uh, to allow, allow us to kind of do some, some data munging steps in sequence. Uh, so we'll start by defining the data frame that we're going to use. And then we will type that into a ggplot. So in ggplot, you have to define the aesthetic. So the AES variable is always, always consists of um, the variables that you want to plot. So we'll start with time begin and data flux CO2. And we'll start with by looking at the turbulent flux um, as it's the primary component of, of the flux. Um, accounting for usually 80 to 90% of the flux during the day. So, And then lastly, we'll want to look at the, the quality of the data. So uh, here, as I was kind of talking through, um, we're using the dplyr package. And we're, we're sending the, the data frame that we developed, uh, that we put together, dfflux into ggplot function. Um, we're defining the data or the aesthetic. Um, and we're just gonna look at the time series here. Uh, so we see it in time begin, um, the turbulent CO2 flux. And, and then we add a color um, associated to those data points as the, the quality, the final quality flag associated with the turbulent CO2 flux. Um, so once you define the aesthetic, then you define what kind of geometric object you wanna use. And we're just using a point uh, for this. Um, and then lastly, we just define the color scale. Um, and then you can also do some really nice things. So part of the reason we added that site variable and combined our data set is uh, for instance, we can facet um, or create a grid of plots based off of the site. So here we can kind of see both the Steigerwald and the Treehaven site next to each other um, with our final quality flags uh, highlighted in different colors. So a zero means that the data are good and have passed all the quality flag and quality metric tests. Uh, and a one uh, means that it failed some quality metric test along the way. Um, inside the, the tutorial page, we kind of give a background uh, as well about how some of the, the quality flags and, and quality metrics are derived um, with some links to additional information, uh, such as our theoretical basis documents and, and things that we use for, for calculating um, these final quality flags. So next we'll just uh, summarize the, the quality metrics associated with the turbulent flux. And you can kind of see um, that at Steigerwald, around 22% of the data uh, are flagged. Uh, and at Steiger, at Treehaven, around 27% 
um, are flagged. And, you know, this takes into account uh, a lot of different components. So there's, there's sensor diagnostic flags, uh, there's plausibility tests associated with the data. Um, additionally, there's theoretical constraints of eddy covariance that are taken into consideration, such as uh, the stationarity test, which um, determines if, if there's uh, sufficient turbulence to, to be able to, to use the eddy covariance data, um, uh, and that the signal is stationary and not changing by too drastically. So a lot of times the stationarity test, for instance, will, will fail in the transition from uh, nighttime to daytime, for instance. So, uh, and then we also have a integral turbulent characteristics flag um, to determine if there is sufficient turbulence uh, to do pretty covariance. So, um, so now that we, we've looked at that, let's dive a little deeper into the quality flag and quality metrics. So we'll take uh, our data frame. Um, we'll feed that into and just grab the, the QFQM label. Um, and then we'll pivot the data from uh, a wide format to, to a, a long format uh, and group it by variable. So this will allow us to kind of be able to summarize uh, how much data are flagged um, for each of our flux variables. And then we'll plot that using ggplot again, uh, but this time we'll be using uh, a bar plot. To... And so here uh, we have a good kind of synopsis of how much data are flagged um, for each of the data products across this couple of month window. Um, you can kind of see that the, the NSAE variables uh, are always the most flagged. Um, and that's because it's kind of a combination of the turbulent flux and the storage flux. So it's compounding the, the flag data as well. Um, and often you will notice that the storage system it has more flags raised than uh, the turbulent. Uh, system and and that's just because there's so many additional moving parts um, and points of failure potentially uh, when you take into consideration all the pumps for each level um, the the sensors the valves that go into to pump, to allowing the data to come into the hut um, and flow into the sensor um, so that's that's the reason that we see uh, kind of the higher flag percentage for storage fluxes. Um, additionally, we're pretty conservative with our flagging currently, and uh, if you were wanting to work with the storage fluxes, we, you're, you could download the expanded file um, and use just the, the flags that you feel are most important um, to take into account. So now that we've kind of analyzed how much flag data we have, uh, we can look at removing the flag data um, before we, we do any additional analysis on the data. So if we run here, you'll see uh, we're basically feeding in the, the flux data frame and selecting all the quality flags uh, associated with the CO2 flux data uh, and summarizing those. Um, and then we're doing the same with data to see how many NAs we have currently. Um, so you can see here on the output we have, uh, we'll just focus on the turbulent data for now, around 4,300 um, raised final quality flags. And currently we have uh, 1,000, 619 uh, NANDs. Now we will apply these, uh, we'll look and grab all the data uh, that have a quality flag, a final quality flag usual one. Um, and we'll, using the which function, we'll grab the index uh, of all the data that are flagged. 
And once we have that index, then we can use that index uh, to change the data, the data in the flux CO2 variable uh, to NAN. And we'll do this for the turbulent, the storage, and the MSA. Um, now, if we still have the same uh, number of flags, but now if we look at the number of NANs, uh, we see that we, we have a greater number of NANs than uh, the flags. So we've applied all those NAN, uh, all the flags to the data. So now that we've kind of munched the data and cleaned it up a little bit, um, now we can kind of plot the data uh, looking at the the data in a different light. So we'll, now we want to look at kind of the deal cycle uh, of the data of the carbon fluxes. So we'll start by creating an hour variable based off of time begin. So we do that just by using the lubricate func function hour um, and then creating a factor variable out of that. So once we have the hour, uh, variable created, we can feed the, the flux data frame into ggplot again. Um, this time we'll be using the hour variable on the x-axis uh, and we'll be plotting the turbulent CO2 flux on the y um, and we'll fill by site. So this will allow us to uh, evaluate the Steigerwald site versus the Treehaven site. Um, and then for this plot, we'll be using a box plot. Uh, and we're going to add a summary uh, line that just goes through the median uh, of the plot to kind of give us an overview of the daily cycle. So when we plot that, you can see this is how the, the daily cycle of the the turbulent CO2 flux looks. Um, and we can see that we have boxes for, the red boxes are for our Steigerwald site uh, and the green boxes are for our Treehaven site um, with the lines running through the median. Um, additionally, the nice thing with the, the box plots is that it, it kind of gives you the median as this middle line but then we also get the interquartile range. So from the 25th percentile to the 75th percentile outlined. Uh, and so it gives us an idea of the kind of variability uh, of the fluxes for each hour of the day um, at each site. Uh, and you can see that we have greater variability at our Steigerwald site, which is a younger forest um, than we do at, at our Treehaven site. Um, additionally, you can see the lines of the whiskers. Uh, these kind of represent the, the bounds of the threshold for outliers. Um, and they're calculated as one, 1 1.5 times the interquartile uh, range. Uh, and then you can see the points here that are um, just the, the outliers. So anything that's outside of uh, of those bounds of the whiskers. And so this can be another good way to, to kind of validate your data as well. Um, but one thing does look funny, right? Like the, the hour, uh, we see that the carbon's being taken up at like seven, you know, the, the peak is around 17, 1600, uh, which we wouldn't expect, right? And, and that's because all of our data are in GMT uh, or UTC. Uh, and so maybe we want to modify the data to, to look at local standard time to get a better idea of when the, the forests are most productive. Um, and we can do that pretty easily since we have the metadata within the HCF5 file. So we can grab one of our HCF5 files. Uh, by using list files and just grabbing uh, an H5. Um, so now that we, we have one of the HDF5 files on, in our file meta variable, 
um, we can use the RHDF5 H5 read attributes function uh, to read in that metadata. So you can see we have a variable here now. It's just a list of the site metadata. Um, so what we kind of looked at when we were looking at the, the HDF5 files and HDF view. Uh, and in this, you can see that we have a time difference between UTC and local time. And so this will allow us to, to easily calculate local standard time. Um, so that's what we'll do next is take our flux uh, data frame and create a new variable called time begin local standard time. Uh, and we'll calculate that just by taking the, the time begin um, and adding the hours uh, from our metadata uh, in the time diff UTC LT variable. And now we'll create a, an hour LST and redo our plot. And that looks a lot better. Now we can kind of see uh, the diurnal cycle that we would expect uh, for fluxes at our site, um, where uh, the productivity starts to, to go up uh, as the plants photosynthesize in the morning. So around uh, six local standard time, uh, and then it starts to die around, to die down around uh, five or six in the afternoon. So. Um, so now that we've looked at the turbulent flux, we, we may also want to look at the, the diurnal cycles of the storage flux. So in this case, we'll just feed in the, the data similar to what we did for the turbulent flux. Um, we'll just change the variable to storage uh, as, opposed, as opposed to turbulent. Um, and here you can kind of see uh, an opposite effect of what we, we had for uh, the turbulent flux. So the storage flux is usually greatest um, at night and during the kind of transition period, so the morning transition uh, and the evening transition. Um, and so th these are particularly important uh, during these transition times and if you're doing analysis uh, on shorter time periods. Over a longer period, like uh, the entire year, um, we don't expect uh, as big of a contribution to the overall net uh, ecosystem exchange. But they can definitely be uh, important on shorter time scales and um, and still contribute up to ten percent or or so um, on the annual scales. It's not a little more, but um, so then. Now that we've looked at uh, the storage, uh, we can look at the combined NSAE flux. Um, and you can see that this plot looks uh, a lot more like the, the turbulent flux um, as it's dominated by those fluxes. So, uh, Lastly, uh, it's really hard to kind of get a an overall cumulative uh, flux without doing some additional processing. So we would need to do um, some U star filtering, some gap filling, uh, and some partitioning of the data um, from net ecosystem change into uh, gross primary productivity (GPP) or uh, and ecosystem respiration to kind of get a really good feel of the the overall carbon dynamics of the site. But just to kind of get a, a feel, um, we can do a mean relative uh, NSAE um, calculation to see how much carbon on, on average the, these two sites are taken up. And so what we'll do here is we'll feed in our flux data frame um, and we'll look for, for anything that contains uh, data and flux CO2 
and, or site. And then we will group the data by site and summarize um, using the mean. And when we do this, we'll see that we, we get an output table uh, with an overall mean carbon flux um, for the net ecosystem exchange or the net surface atmosphere exchange, the storage, and for the turbulent component. Um, and you can see overall for th these two sites uh, that Steigerwald uh, takes up a little bit more carbon than Treehaven, which is kind of to be expected as it's a, a, a pretty young uh, forest that's growing pretty rapidly. Um, whereas the tree haven forest is a little bit more mature. Um, uh, but you can kind of see too that the tree haven uh, actually takes up more carbon um, with storage. So whether it's a understory growth um, uh, or, or some other dynamic going on there, it's, uh, it's actually kind of bringing it closer to, to Steigerwald and overall uh, NSAE, um, as opposed to, you know, the bigger difference that we see with the turbulent flux. So, so that's it for the tutorial. Um, now we can kind of take questions and uh, if, let me know if anybody's having any issues or trouble with, with running the tutorial as well.